All right, and we're live here at StreamYard. And welcome back first um, to our show. And uh, we appreciate your time being with us and everything. Um, man, you have quite a, quite a background. So I'm going to try to read it without my voice giving out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll find it here. So, um, yeah, welcome back to our show. I just start with that first. Supernatural Whispers podcast, and I'm host Nicole Jasper, and uh, so I'll try to share this pretty soon. And uh, so Chris McDonnell is the uh, founder and director of the Water Lake City Foundation for Paranormal Research, which carries on the work of his grandparents, Ed and Lorraine Warren, and uh, which I'm also part of for about a year now. <laughs> I'm still stoked about that. And uh, he's been investigating the mysteries of the paranormal since the 1980s. Excuse me, my voice gives up sometimes. In the 1980s, a scary knowledge and experience to help dispel the uh, superstition and folklore that accumulated around extraordinary phenomena. And so he now leads this international network of uh, paranormal researchers that expands the Warren's mission all over the world and continues his research into the many uh, studying aspects of paranormal. So as always, I look forward to having you back on our show, Chris. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Sorry about these. Tech issues that we were supposed to be on restream, but I think I'm gonna stick to stream yard from now on. So, what have you been up to lately? You know, it's been a while since we last chat, huh? Uh, yeah, well, let's see. Um, I spent about uh, four months in Paraguay and then a couple of months in Brazil, and now I'm back home in Colombia. and. Couldn't oh, wow. be happier. Uh, weather here is perfect. I'm looking out at the mountainside. I can see the uh, one of the crucifixes all lit up with lights, and uh, the big statue of Jesus Christ up on the mountainside. It's really nice here. I bet it's nice to see. I'll have to get over there eventually. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend South America, especially Colombia. Um, I've lived in 98 places around the world now, and uh, Colombia is my favorite. I keep saying to myself, I had to work on my passport this year. This year's the year I'm going to work on my passport. It isn't hard. <laughs> Nor is it that yeah. expensive. It, it's like $125 to get a passport. And flying to Colombia, depending on where you're flying from, it's ridiculously cheap. I oh, asked you to know. Thank you. The words of my question. Of course, if y'all are listening or in comment, be sure to send your questions to us anytime. Yeah, I'm and, an uh, open book. You. I'm happy to answer anybody's <laughs> questions. I'm here to teach. All right, awesome. And uh, so, where did I lose my question? I always have a list of questions. And I thought of this few last night. I'm like, I better get them all. In. Here's some questions ready is already coming up. <laughs> so um, the first question would be um how did how did you become uh interested in the paranormal and decide to pursue a career as an as exorcist? If you don't well, mind me asking. I, I, I think how did I become interested in the paranormal? Did I have a choice? I mean honestly with my with my family? I mean <laughs> You know, Ed and Lorraine Warren, I mean, your your grandparents, you're going to be exposed to this world one way or the other. And I do not like mysteries. So I, yeah, this, this is something I've dedicated my life to. And I, I don't do it for the thrill. I don't do it because, you know, it's spooky and interesting and scary and all that. I do it because there's a real need and because there's 
there are a lot of families out there who are in trouble, don't know where to get good, reputable help, where they're not going to be exposed to the public, where they're going to have be able to go back to normal life when they're done. And that's what we do with the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. We, we offer free and confidential services backed by literally many, 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 many decades of experience. I mean, between, we have over 100 members in the foundation. And on average, I would guess that our people have it at the very least on average 10, 10 hour or 10 years of experience. Some of them like me, you know, quite a bit more. I wish I could slow it down, but you know, I'm just going to keep getting older. Yeah, that would be my next question. What is the, um, let's see the background of the, 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 um, that you came up with it with Mrs. Lorraine, right? That you started. I'm, you, you, I'm sorry? You and, Mrs., you and Mrs. Lorraine actually started the uh, foundation, right? Sorry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. After the first movie came out, um, we were getting hit by requests for help all over the world. And I'd been in the Peace Corps and taught in the Middle East and Europe and Asia and Africa and all over. So... I had a lot of experience working with volunteers and working um, with other cultures. And I realized that we could take that experience and expand the foundation or exp expand my grandparents' mission, I should say, um, so that we could help people everywhere. And my grandmother loved the idea, especially because, you know, we we're going to name it the Warren Legacy Foundation instead of... Right the New England Society for Psychic Research. You know, she, she liked the idea of keeping the name alive. That's a good idea, yeah. I'm glad you did that. Because uh, we, we come all over the world that when that a lot of us are gifted, right? And that's, I'm glad we can help in any way that we can. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as you're well aware, we have um, two psychic support groups online. Uh, we help people with their abilities. Uh, both in right. English and in Spanish. Or, and currently we have about a thousand members around the world that we help. Uh, it's something my grandmother used to do one-on-one -on -one with people, but you know, after the movies came out, that just was impossible. And this is a very therapeutic place where right. people get support from one another. And I, I think it's probably one of the best things that we do. And it makes me pretty excited. That's awesome. Oh, it was my questions here. <laughs> it seems um, and most of the cases are actually, well, I don't want to say that word. I don't know if you like that word, demonic. Are most of them that dark or can't get that dark? No. No. M m most things are pretty easy, pretty simple. Uh, just because you don't understand something doesn't mean you have to fear it. You know, just because you hear footsteps walking in the hallway at night after you go to bed, it doesn't mean it's the devil come to take your soul. It's probably, you know, the old lady that lived in the house before you. Excuse me, it's after nine o'clock at night and I'm excited. I'm, I'm exhausted. Sorry. Um, but, you know, it's probably the, the old lady who lived in the house before you or it's your, your dad come to visit you, perhaps. You know, and it's your fear that takes a beautiful experience and turns it into something less desirable. Um, most of the time, we're just dealing with a human being or a psychic whose abilities are out of control or, you know, it, it, it's just somebody visiting. And those are not dangerous. Most of the things we deal with are not dangerous. Having said that, Yes, we, we do deal with life-threatening things. We deal with things that have killed people. Um, this is not something to be taken lightly. You don't know what you're going to get any particular day on in this work. You, know, you, you think, oh, well, there's nothing really going on there. And the next thing you know, you've got things flying around your house, including yourself, because 
you've upset something that's trying to attack somebody that you're, you, you should be helping. So don't, don't treat this like a hobby, please. Whoever's out there listening to this, you know, you're dealing with real people's lives and you got to take that seriously. That's true, yeah. I would say you want to play any game, play Monopoly instead of the Ouija board for that matter, right? <laughs> I always say that. So yeah. what is what is your yeah. view or thing about the Ouija board since I brought it up? Should it be like this for like definition of what you highly recommend? I'm sorry, what are my views or opinions on what? The Ouija board. Oh, um, since I brought it up, so <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have a problem with Ouija boards by themselves any more than I have a problem with tarot cards or pendulums or anything. Um, right. My problem is with your intention to make contact with the spirit world. Ouija boards are a more they are absolutely made simply for spirit communication. You know, uh, tarot cards, pendulums, they can be used for divination and other things. But a Ouija board pretty much only has one use. And if you're in a negative headspace, you could attract something very bad. My grandmother used to say that um, like attracts like. If you're putting out negative energy into the universe, you're going to attract something negative. And both of my grandparents felt that the Ouija board contributed more cases than any other cause out there for them. I do apologize. My device, I didn't want to say the name, that device keeps going off. Yeah, I don't know there, if you heard there's that. some kind of an odd feedback sound. It's hard to understand. Yeah, it. sorry. Bring my mic closer. That help. Um, my device keeps going off. My um, you know, my Alexa device. So that's probably. I apologize about that. Yes. Well, it recognizes my voice sometimes. Yes. Let's see, uh, I have some more questions. And of course, if you guys want to chime in, send us your questions. Mm -hmm. And um, so, like, um, I don't know if I mentioned this last night, we had a scare because uh, we thought the gas was leaking, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had to call the uh, fire department just to be on the safe side. So, um, so we can really do that out. And so, and the smell kept attenuating. And it, they said it's more likely I like the sulfur smell. But I'm starting to smell that too. And so, could that be anything of, of an entity or a dark entity, you think? Or just this? Well, it could, I mean, don't get me wrong, it could be, but you should always look for the natural explanation yeah. first. And remember, even though the fire department didn't find any evidence of a gas leak, right. they do add that that bad egg smell, that sulfur smell, to gas. Like smelling bad eggs, too. So the, you know, there may be a natural explanation there. And you, you should always look for the natural over the supernatural first. That's true. Um, it's like a water and should have been a plumbing or something or electrical maybe a neighbor it, it, it could have yeah. been a whole whole bunch of different things yeah as long as you're yeah, not the thing about the paranormal judge things by the consequences so in other words just because you hurt heard that didn't kill you that didn't hurt you you know, don't jump out of your skin just because you heard a knocking noise. Uh, maybe somebody's trying to get your attention. You know, uh, a pot flies across the room. Did it hurt you? No. Well, maybe it's just somebody trying to get your attention. You know, so always look for the consequences. Always 
look at it uh, with a clear head, not with fear. Fear is the real enemy. Now, I, I know this smudging only lasts for so long, so I did that a little bit, and it, the ending sense kind of went away. So, yeah, I didn't waste <clears throat> too much time for that. So, uh, let's see. Let's see, I want to give Eric Post a shout out for allowing me part of their team. So thank you, guys. And uh, let's see, I have another question here. Can you share a uh, like memorable experience from one of your exorcisms without revealing like any personal details? What what impacts you the most? Oh, yeah. People like to ask about the exorcisms. The truth is, they're very rare, um, and I find myself in an odd position. I'm an exorcist who doesn't believe in demons. Uh, so I, I believe in us. I, I believe in the amazing power we have uh, and how we can create thought forms and so forth. But I remember the first time I personally had to perform an exorcism. And it wasn't planned. It was an emergency. Uh, a young woman with her baby, her, her newborn baby. Uh, she had been working with a priest. She had been trying to get help. And then I get a phone call from her girlfriend that she was with. And she's under possession. And she's trying to get to the baby. Uh -huh. And yeah, of course, I immediately went in to exorcism rites, even though I had to do it over the computer, which is insane. You know, you, you shouldn't be doing remote exorcisms for goodness sake. Um, but we pulled her out of it. Yeah, no, um, we pulled her out of it. Um, and we, we got her the proper help she needed. And uh, there was one more incident with her where I had to go in again and do another exorcism. And I worked with the priest that she was working with and that it had a, a good outcome. Um, but they're not things to be taken lightly. Can you imagine? I mean, I had one case in uh, Colorado. And there, there was an actual entity in the house. The the husband and wife were also drug users, which is probably why this thing was able to get a grip on them and manifest around them and everything. It tried to kill the mother, the, the woman, uh, tr pulled her under the bath water and held her under. And her boyfriend came and pulled her out of the water, but it took a while to resuscitate her. Um, but one wow. time the baby disappeared and when they found the baby, it was in a different bedroom, in a different crib with lit candles surrounding it. So, yeah, not something to be taken lightly. We got social services involved as well. We got them the medical help they needed for their drug abuse. Uh, we got them back into the church. We got them... Uh, a deliverance and everything worked out fine, but it, it's not something easy. You know, when you're dealing with these things, when, when you're under attack by these things, there's a reason for it. There's a lesson for you to learn there. And if you're not willing to walk that path, if you're not willing to fight that fight, then we can, you know, hold your hand as much as possible but we can't we can't win the war without you. You you got to fight it with us. That's true. Thank you for sharing it. That's my place here. <laughs> so um, that kind of leads to my next question. Uh, so what kind of signs or symptoms do you look for and to determine? 
if someone is possibly possessed. Okay. 43 years of doing this work, I've worked well over 10,000 cases, and I've only dealt with about a dozen possession cases. They are rare. Uh, when we're dealing with these things, we're looking for them to display knowledge that the human being could not possibly have. For instance, uh, there was a little girl in San Jose, Costa Rica, who was under possession. And she knew each time I was on my way to the house. And she'd be screaming at the family, don't let that pastor hear. I don't want him. So she knew. Um, that kind of information is important. That they, they show us information that cannot be gotten through earthly means if they're speaking in other tongues that they they themselves don't know that's another one uh displaying extraordinary strength or um paranormal abilities also obvious uh indicators but having said all of that even so you could be an out of control psychic you could be manifesting uh, phenomena around you, like a poltergeist, and it takes a while. You got to go through medical evaluations, psychological evaluations, uh, religious provocation, all sorts of different things to truly determine whether or not a person is uh, under possession. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, unfortunately, there are too many groups out there that want to label everything demonic. Demonic, yeah. Including Hollywood. Um, and That's people, demonic. you know, they, they get terrified. And unfortunately, m most of the time, there's no real good reason to be afraid. Right. Especially when you have your faith to back you up, right? I'm sorry? Especially when we have strong in our faith to back us, to back exactly. us up. Exactly. Exactly. But you, you, you have to be not just strong in faith, but strong in intention. When you're, when you're praying, it, it's a dialogue with God. It's not magic words that you're reciting to, to scare away evil. You know, you're actually talking to God. And nothing is more powerful than God. So you're in good hands. Right. Okay, uh, let's see. Hey, can you describe the, uh, like, on the top of the exorcism, um, or exorcism, can you describe the preparation process that you go through, and is it different for the person on a case before conducting the exorcism? Sorry, that's two and one. <clears throat> Exorcism rites are performed in every major religion in the world. And each religion deals with them in a different way. I am a pastor without a religion. Um, I don't think God cares what your religion is. God cares about your faith and your compassion and empathy for others. Um, at least that's been my experience when I study around the world. And when I see prayers answered in every language, you know, um, that says an awful lot more about God than it does about us, maybe. Um, and how we use these little hints of truth that we, we call spiritual knowledge as a way of um, separating ourselves from others who have different slivers of truth. And I don't think that's what God would ever want. How do I personally um, prepare? As long as I'm not being thrown in the deep end uh, and didn't really, you know, have a chance to prepare. There are prayers, there's fasting, um, there, there's just general preparation to get myself in the right headspace. I want to make sure that I am not 
feeling depressed, not under any uh, negative influences because I don't want to bring that in with me to the household. Um, I want to fill myself up with light and joy and feel myself very well centered before I go into the house. And then I'm going to bring in some of the items that I got from my grandmother, you know, rosary beads and things of that because of that nature because they were important to her and therefore they're a very powerful focus for me for my faith when i'm <laughs> talking to god all right thank you for sharing that i have 30 shout outs for you that you'd like to share it to share with us i'm i'm sorry there, there... do you have at any time you want you can Give some shout outs if you like. Share, just share some shout outs. I don't know if I said it right. Do Do I have any what that I'd like to share? If you have anything that you like to share, like shout shout outs, then you share. Uh, oh no 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 shout outs for anything of that sort. <laughs> um, the the only people I pay attention to in the paranormal world are our members. And if I'm going to make a shout out, it's yeah, to our members, they're the best. Um, yeah. They're incredibly well dedicated and caring and compassionate, you know, like my interviewer this evening. Um, oh, thank you. And I'm very proud of all of you. And uh, we're very careful about who's a member of the foundation. We make sure that our clients are always our first priority. Thank you. My voice gives out sometimes. Sorry about that. No, no, no. I know you. You've got some health issues there, and we can cut this short whenever you need to. I understand. Uh, okay, I have a few more questions up my sleeve. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, hopefully, the people listening can share their questions. And uh, of course, this will be on replay as well. And the. Uh, you can watch it. I'll share it on YouTube and then Anchor and Spotify. So uh, let's see. What do we leave off? Read here. But how how do you handle like skeptic? I can't say that word for the life of me. Skeptic skepticism. Uh, -huh. uh criticism. From those who may doubt it, it's just in, uh, you know. In, How in, do I handle a crisis of what? Skeptic, like skeptic. Uh, I cannot say that word. Um, <laughs> skeptics, on uh, or criticism that you know who don't believe in existence. Oh, and, uh, like, how do I deal with paranormal? people who don't believe in the paranormal? Yeah. I, I don't care if they don't believe in the paranormal. Sorry. My my job is my, my job isn't to open the eyes of the ignorant. My my job is to help people who need help. If you're not having problems with the paranormal, great. And chances are your disbelief will help you to not have problems with the paranormal for quite a long time. You know, you can close yourself off from it. So I, I'm overjoyed if you don't believe. I'm not offended. Why should I should why should I be offended? I've spent 43 years studying this stuff, and I'm more skeptical than anyone I know. I've seen it, and I'm skeptical. You know, on every single case, I expect it to be natural first. You know, until I have overwhelming proof that it's not. So. No, I don't have a problem with that. I'm a very I, rational person. I try to be like a both skeptic and a believer. As having gifts, I have too many things not to believe that happen to me. So, well, see, I'm, I, like I'm, not, I'm not a believer. I'm I I know some facts. I know some facts, but I also know what I don't know. And I'm at the point in my life where I know enough to help people, but I don't know enough 
to explain the mysteries of the universe, for instance. Um, right. The universe is too big and we are too small and I'm not going to get there in this lifetime. And I'm perfectly content with that. If I can't answer my own questions, how can I be upset with somebody not believing me when I can't answer theirs either? Right, and I have another question. Hopefully, um, let's see. Uh, what what advice do you give to individuals who believe they may be dealing with, you know, paranormal activity? Please contact us at warrenfiles.com or go to Instagram at uh, warrenfiles, hashtag warrenfiles, or Contact us on Facebook at the Warren Legacy Foundation uh, for Paranormal Research and ask for help. We're here to help. That's the, Don't contact television. They're not there to help. They're there for advertising dollars. And that's all they care about. The producers care less about one episode and one family in trouble, they're gonna use you. Don't don't let them. Just contact us. Thank you, Sarah. And I always say, if I can't help, maybe I can help steer them in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. yeah we we've got a code of ethics, and one of our one of our uh, ethical codes is. You know, you don't get rid of a case until you find somebody else to take it over. You know, you don't leave that family behind. One of the, we never use the word demon in the Warren Legacy Foundation because it's a loaded word. And it, it, it doesn't mean a lot in reality because in reality, these things manifest according to our cultural and spiritual beliefs, not according to one religion they manifest all over the world differently um and i was just gonna ask that is it the same or is it different according to the differently no religion. differently and and all of these rituals against them work which says a lot too mm -hmm. um but we don't use the word demon because it's a loaded word it's a terrifying word right and we're here yeah, to empower people first and one of the things I hate about, and now this is going to sound terrible because here I am, I'm a psychic medium raised by my grandmother who was one of the greatest ever. And I don't trust psychics at all, not without evidence, because a psychic can say just the wrong thing at the wrong time and send a family down a rabbit hole. And that can be devastating. So our psychics don't just spout off their feelings willy-nilly. Um, they share their impressions with the team leader. The team leader does a proper investigation without looking at those impressions. And then you uh, compare notes later to see if there's anything, you know, correlating there. Right, like if I give the case or, or help person, I'd, I'd love, rather not know much about the background while he's still going. I'd rather know afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we, no, psychics cannot know anything uh, because right. if they go in there knowing something, then they're biased. Oh, no. And that just doesn't work. A psychic That's has true. to go in blind. That's the way I like to do it. <laughs> yeah. That's the only ethical way to do it. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. Sure. Um, let's see. I love my place here. I'm trying to think of a good one for you. Can you discuss any specific uh, like racial or practices that are commonly used to uh, protect ourselves from any entity? Yeah, in, in North America, Europe, and South America, we use the white light a lot. 
because it's rather generic. Uh, it's also it can also be called the light of Allah or the Christ light. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is your focused intention to call on God as you see God, to have God fill you up, surround you, protect you, and push aside all negative energy. Um, that is probably the number one protection ritual that is used in the field by most people, one way or the other. You know, as I said, you don't have to be a Christian to do this work, but having zero faith is probably not the smartest idea in the world. I totally use that too, the white light method. So, yeah, I've used it many times. All right, a few more questions. And uh, have you ever encountered a case that you were unable to resolve? And if so, what factors contributed to the outcome? That's unfortunately a reality. Um, my grandparents probably only solved one out of three cases back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s. Oh, wow. um, well, I, I think we do better now, but I think that's because there's such a higher value, volume of cases now. And we deal with a lot of little things and the little ones are so easy. Um, but if you're not willing to help yourself, we can't help you. If you don't believe in what we're doing, we're going to fail to help you. If you don't deal with the underlying issues that are making you vulnerable to the paranormal, again, yeah, we can get rid of it for a little while, but it's going to come back. You know, if, you, if you've got PTSD, schizophrenia, uh, drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, depression, some form of trauma, domestic abuse, whatever it happens to be, even if it's just, you know, you're a teenager with out of control hormones and uh, emotions. If we're not dealing with those issues, then we're not going to really help you. We have to deal with everything holistically. So what often is the reason we're unable to help anyone or help someone, I mean? It's because they don't want to change. They don't want to help themselves. Or because they're so invested in the idea of this being something truly horrific when it's not, that there's very little we can do. Worst scenario is when we get a call, hi, I got a demon in my house. Another team came in. They told me I've got a demon. And now we've got to spend weeks, if not months, trying to convince them they don't actually have a demon. Because some jackass who wants to get his clicks and likes, you know, said, oh, yeah, it's a demon. And then they ran out the door. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Happens all the time. And sometimes they actually need to... Entities they actually uh, have met threefold with more of them, right? They or they can be more stronger. I don't know. I can't understand you. What? Sometimes they can return with others, right? And are we talking about you know, the, maybe, the living teams or the spirits? The spirits or entities. Well, yeah, spirits attract spirits. That's true. They they can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Um, I lose my place here. <laughs> well, I think I'll kind of elaborate on that. Um, how do you balance your role as an ethicist with your pers personal beliefs and values? Well, like I said, I mean, I've been doing this over four decades and I've only 
either performed or assisted on about a dozen exorcisms. That's one every, what, three years? Every, you know, two and a half years? That's not very many. Um, my faith, I, I came about my faith when I accepted my ignorance. And I I'm, I'm feel the same way about the paranormal. I'm perfectly happy not having the answers that I wish I had had decades ago. You know, it, it'll happen in the fullness of time with my descendants, maybe. But uh, it isn't that important to me. I, I'm more comfortable today living in with mysteries than I used to be. Thank you. I find I find mystery quite uh, intriguing, but I'm weird. <laughs> well, I used to love um, Sherlock Holmes and Batman, but uh, I, I I like to. I always hated those movies where you don't know how they end. You know, it, those bug the heck out of me. So I, I guess um, I've just learned a little more humility with this uh, work. This work can definitely make you oh, yeah. a humble person um, because you realize very quickly, as much as everybody else wants to call you an expert, you realize how little you know. If you call me that sometimes and I give them a funny look, I'm like, what? Yeah, well, um, I, I, I hate it when people think I'm some kind of an expert. And I, I get that a lot, you know, but I, I'm not. No one is. Yeah, I would say I have a lot of experience, but I'm not, yeah. <laughs> so, I, um, I don't know why, but there, there's always this, like, cutting in and out. Every time I talk my, to you my, on my, a video, it must be something with your um, microphone. My audio. Sorry about that. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, in your opinion, what role does does fear play in manifestation and um, of like at paranormal activity? It's not just fear; it's whatever your energetic output is. Um, if you're radiating joy and love, yeah, that's how these things will manifest. If you're radiating fear and terror, again, that's how it's going to manifest. Because when we're dealing with something that's not a human spirit, then we're often dealing with something called a thought form or a tulpa or an egregore. And this is a manifestation of a spirit created by our own energy. Right. So um, the, the role of fear cannot be overestimated. Um, fear is the real enemy. And uh, what advice would you give to some, someone considering um, an exorcist or a paranormal investigator? I don't understand why anybody would want to be an exorcist. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I didn't choose this. It, it, it was thrust upon me as an emergency. Um, I see all of these people online calling themselves exorcists, you know, people who've learned something online and now they've got their certificate and they they want to, you know, run out there and prove how special they are in the eyes of God. I was like, to me, that's ego. You know, if, if you're getting into this for the thrill, because you want to be the big man, you want to be the hero, then you're not doing it right. When your ego is that big, you're pushing God out of the room and you're going to fail. Um, this isn't about you. If you're doing this work, you're only a tool. You're nothing more than a tool. 
being used by a greater power. And if you think that you, the hammer, are so bloody special, then you're missing the point that there's an actual artist holding that hammer and, and using it properly. That's not you. That's true, yeah. You know, so if you're getting into this work, if that's what you want to do, join up with a reputable team. The Vatican offers courses in demonology. Um, not a fan, because if you go in to learn that, you're going to learn it from a Catholic perspective. You're not going to learn it from a worldly perspective or from a multicultural perspective. And that's going to limit you. And if you don't believe in the Catholic perspective, then it, it's worthless information. That's true. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, I have a few more questions here. Um, oh, have you ever encountered cases that uh, possess individuals that exhibit supernatural abilities? Or phenomenon during the yes. I'm sorry. I, I, I again I can't understand what you're saying. You're it's too breathy, I think. Have I ever I'm encountered sorry. cases where what? Um possess individuals that is it supernatural abilities or phenomena during the yes. Uh, yes. Oh yes, of course. Of course, many times. Um many oh, well. times. The, we learned early on to make sure that we restrain uh, anyone who's under possession. Um, and the way we do it now is we'll take things like um, towels and wrap them around a person's arms and legs and around the chair legs and arms and then use um, duct tape. So that we're not actually taping their, their skin. We're not taping their arms. Um, but I've seen a man rip apart a very sturdy chair that he had been oh, wow. taped into as soon as I started the exorcism. Uh, I have seen a man crying tears of blood and drooling blood and his, his forehead cracking open and his eyes taking on the look of a snake and um, yeah, I've seen a lot of things during possession. It, it's not something you should hope to want to see. Yes, I've been reading about uh, Satan's Harvest, but I was halfway done with it. What, yeah, that, that's did. that's the Maurice Theriel case. Right. That was that's one of mine thinking. as well. That was the one where my grandfather actually did have a heart attack during the exorcism. Hmm. Wow. Where <clears throat> to hear that? Well, he lived, thank God. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they can be intense. I'm sorry? Let's see, I know they can be intense. And, uh, you know, scary at times. Um, do you have any places on your bucket list that you would like to visit? <laughs> yeah, everywhere I haven't been. <laughs> I really want to see Ireland and Iceland. Yeah, I'm right. I, I want to see Ireland. I want to see Iceland, Norway. Um... There are a lot of places I want to go back to. I loved Egypt. Um, oh, I'd love to go there. I'd like to go back to Nepal. I'd love to go back to Thailand. Um, I'd love to go back to New Zealand. Uh, all of Europe. Portugal, I'm in love with. Spain, I'm in love with. Greece, the islands. Uh, good. Listen, uh, my life has been a movable feast, and I have enjoyed 
sampling from all over the world. It, it, it has been the greatest privilege of my life. I don't have I, money. I travel more. <laughs> yeah, well, you can. You don't need money. That's the thing people think you need money. I don't have any money. I couldn't afford to live in the United States to save my life. I couldn't afford a car, let alone an apartment. Yes, why not? But I can money? live in Colombia and live a very good life here. Or travel around the world. I just, like I said, I was just in Paraguay. Uh, fantastic place, by the way. Asuncion, oh, wow. Paraguay. You can get a gourmet sushi meal with crispy spring rolls and this amazingly good mint herb tea. Uh, I, lemonade, I mean. Sounds All of it was like six bucks. For 10 pieces wow. of sushi with all of that. So, you know, there, there are places in this world you can live if you've got a small pension and you don't have to worry. And that's why I live in South America. It's the most affordable, friendly place I could possibly have ended up. All right. And I think we have time for one more question. What's your favorite book or author? My favorite author? You mean of my grandparents' books? Or any book. No I'm sorry? Or any book. Oh, well, any book's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, my favorite book of all time is Illusions by uh, Richard Bach. He's the same guy that wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And it probably take you about well, two, or, two or three hours to read, but it had a very strong impact on me. Um, as for my grandparents' books, anything by uh, what was his name? Br not Richard Brittle. Brittle was his name. Okay. David Brittle. Oh my gosh, I can't remember his first name. But anyway, he wrote The Demonologist and The Devil in Connecticut. Gerald Brittle. Gerald Brittle. And um, yeah, those like are not bad books. In a Dark Place, absolutely terrible piece of crap. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my case. That book is garbage. Uh, Satan's Harvest was written by two Boston Globe reporters. Excellent book. Highly recommend it. Um... But, yeah, they, they had a lot of turkeys because they didn't write any books themselves. They, they were written by others. All right. Thank you for sharing it. And I, I was going to say, I also like the demonologist. The one that you were reading for a while. Yeah. No, I, 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 I was um, astounded when I was rereading that. Yeah, it's funny. I read it twice. <laughs> Looking back on, well, I've read it at least that many times. Um, I mean, this book came out in, what, 78? So my grandparents' views at that time were a lot different than they were later on. That's what people don't understand. They, they want to read these things and watch these videos, and they think they understand who my grandparents were. They're only getting a snapshot in time. They're not seeing where they end up at the end of their research and I'm lucky I, I got to stand on their shoulders and I got to get all their knowledge and then go beyond that and uh, yeah where we are today is no, nowhere near where my grandparents were in the 70s or 80s for, for instance heck my grandfather thought witchcraft was exactly the same thing as Satanism and rock and roll was Satanic and I mean yeah, yeah. he was a product of his of his time. He was a World War II vet in the 70s and early 80s. That's what he thought of those things. Later on in life, he didn't. Hey, for sharing that, I always used to say about um, everything that you went through and thank you for me on our show tonight. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we go? Just, if you need help, please come to warmfiles.com. Click on the contact us link and 
fill out a form to let us know what's going on with you, or if you want to join the foundation, uh, same thing, there's a contact us link for that as well. But we are very careful when we do background checks and everything else, because our clients are Anyway, other than that, Nicole, thank you for having me on, as always. I always love being on with you, and I, I hope your voice feels better very soon. Thank you very much. Hopefully I'll be on a better time zone next time. Yeah, yeah, it's 10 o'clock at night and I still haven't even had dinner. Actually, I did have breakfast. That's all. I got a late dinner too. Thank you. Um, I just appreciate you all, and I I just keep you on my prayers and everything. And uh, you know, stay safe. And thank you guys for watching or listening. The Supernatural Whispers podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Jasper. I'm sorry, this is just a new mic. So anyway, you guys have a great, safe week, and I'll see you next week. God bless you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Well, yeah, so thank you, guys. Have a great and safe night. Bye.